As always, I am so excited to be here with you. Um, and even though we're doing this through video, um, we are worshiping in truth and spirit. So we're in this together, right? And we're gonna worship God together. We're gonna bring Him glory. We're gonna exalt Him today together and encounter Him in a very intimate way. We're gonna be kicking off a new series. We just came out of Jonah, uh, Big Fish Jonah, but we're gonna be kicking off a new series today called Heroes. And we're gonna jump in that here in just a few moments, but we wanna worship God through song, singing right now. So if you would, let's prepare our hearts to do that. And in addition to that, if you would very quickly, if you haven't already, would you please get yourself some uh, elements that you're going to use because we're going to take communion today. So if you would get some elements together, something that's going to some uh, juice or whatever, we're not legalistic here, but get something that's going to remind you of the blood of Christ, the, to symbolize the blood of Christ, and then something that would remind you of his flesh. Regardless of what it is, all it is is symbolism so that we can be reminded of the work that, that Jesus did on the cross that God did for our salvation. And so please, if you would, grab those real quick as we begin our time together.
heaven feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like So again, today we are kicking off a new series called Heroes. And this is going to take us actually through the summer and the kids are going to be doing some of the, the same heroes that we're going to be looking at as well uh, as us adults are, are discussing. The kids are going to be uh, discussing uh, those as well. So we're kind of be in line. Uh, so if you're watching this and you have kids and your kids have been downstairs uh, in their time of worship, please uh, have some discussion with them about what they've learned and what they are learning about some of the heroes uh, that we're going to look at through the scripture. So I'm really excited about this. However, we're going to really kick it off uh, June 2nd. I think that's the first Sunday in June. But what I want to do for this week and next week, I kind of want to give us a couple intros uh, and kind of set the whole series up for us um, as adults. So I pray that you will just stick with us, that you will engage as we look at some heroes throughout the scripture. What's very interesting, too, is um, as Abby and I were planning this together, we were looking at some of these uh, individuals, men and women, through the Scriptures. Uh, what you're going to find is that the majority, now there's a couple that, that's kind of uh, excluded from this, but what's really interesting is that these individuals that we're going to look at were absolutely regular humans, well, they're all humans, right? But they had their, some of them had their ups and downs. They weren't perfect by any means. Now, there was a couple that, as we look at, that they really lived their lives with integrity, but with a lot of them, they're still heroes, but they had their challenges as well. And when we say that, when I talk about it from that perspective, uh, it sounds kind of odd, but it's encouraging. It's encouraging to know that you and I can be heroes, even though we may struggle at times. Uh, because we are on this journey and we're all humans and uh, we're living in this fallen world and fallen uh, bodies. Uh, and until we see Jesus and receive our glorious body and we're with Him for eternity, we're going to, we're going to struggle with things. We're going to struggle with things. Now, hopefully, um, uh, when it comes to struggling with things, those come more far and few between, right? Because we're growing in our spiritual walks with Him. Uh, but I just want to say it is encouraging to know that these individuals were certainly not perfect whatsoever, just like you and I. So it's very encouraging. And we're called to be heroes as well uh, within, our, within our lives, within our walks. And so, um, again, I pray that you will find this encouraging uh, as, you know, as we go through this particular series. One of the things that I think defines a hero throughout scriptures is that these men and women identified the values in which they were going to build their lives upon. Um, they identified 
their values in which they will build or build their lives, built their lives upon. Now, when I say that, uh, I, let me recognize and just say this. We all have values. The way you live your life, you live out your values, okay? Now, there are some things that we would say, well, I don't value that, but yet it's evidenced within our lives because we build our lives upon that. We, we would say, well, this is a value because I, this is present within my life. And again, I think that's where sometimes we get into this rub, this tension, because we will say, well, I really don't value that, but we must because we engage in this, because I build my life, you know, there's a lot of my life that is built upon this. So sometimes a value can be a very good value, and sometimes it can be a very bad value. But nevertheless, we value it. Does that make sense? Let me continue on. So um, in the counseling world, uh, there is a modality of counseling called ACT. And what ACT is, it's built on the premise that we live out those things that we value. And when we don't live out, the, when we are not allowed, when we are not capable or we are um, stifled from living out the things that we say that we value, it creates dissonance, it creates frustration, it creates conflict. We see that within marriages where the marriage, is, the marriage, the relationship is one believes one thing, another person believes something differently, and we see conflict because both of those individuals are trying to live out the values in which they state, and they're not able to, and so it creates conflict within that relationship. And essentially that's what it is within, you know, throughout our lives. If we don't live out something that we have identified as a value, it creates conflict uh, within us, uh, internally within us. So the question then becomes, what are those values? What do we say that we value? What are we building our lives upon? What are the values in which we say, I believe that if I build my life upon this, and I'm going to elevate this as a value of mine, what would you say those values are? What would you say, what would you identify are the values of your life? Now, I want you to be, I want you to think about that question because sometimes we will talk about aspirational values and not actual values. And so what I want us to do is I want us to critically think about what are those actual values within our lives. We might say, well, prayer is a value of my life, but we don't, we don't engage in prayer. So it, then it becomes more of an aspirational. If something is demonstrated and evident within your life, that's when you truly can say that it's a, it's a value. It's not just aspirational, but it's an actual value that I build my life upon. So my question to you would be, what are your values? What are the things that you say that you value? I want to read a passage of Scripture to you to, for us to get started and just to think about, and it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. Now, the context of this is God gave Moses this sermon, this teaching, this, this um, message to deliver to the people of Israel at that time. And as Moses is delivering this, he's telling them, you need to remember. You need to remember God. You need to keep Him at the center of your lives at all times. And uh, it's often referred to as the Shema, where he is saying, this is God, okay? And, and, and you've got to remember who God is, all right? And in verses 6 and 7, um, actually, I'm going to start in verse 4 of chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. It says this, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in verse 6, he says this, These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Verse 7, Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Now, what, and I would encourage you to go back and revisit um, uh, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy and read a little bit further in, because God is saying through Moses, you need 
to put what I'm telling you into your heart. You need to build your life upon what I'm about to tell you. You need to make these your values. You need to remember them at all times. At all times. And furthermore, repeat them to your children. Get them into your children. Teach them to your children. Put them everywhere. Everywhere you look. Everywhere you look. Have them so that when you look, you will be reminded, oh, that, that is a value of mine. You know, this is what my life is going to be built upon. Okay? And, and it starts by understanding that there's only one God, and it's Yahweh. There's only one God, and we are to love God, and the Lord is one. And then he says, again, love the Lord your God with all your what? With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is what I want deep in your heart, is what God is saying. And what Moses is telling these Israelites, um, or what God is telling these Israelites through the voice of Moses. So with that being said, we're going to talk about values today. And we're going to talk about to be a true hero, we have identified the proper values to build our lives upon. And those aren't values that we have constructed, but they're values, they are the values that God has instructed. Now, there is, you know, when we talk about values and we talk about family values and teaching these to our children, you know, there's a lot of values that, that families teach their, their children, okay? And we may say, well, that's not what I really teach, but when you, if we could step back and just kind of take a big picture look, this is what, we, this is what you kind of see. One of them would be money, right? One of them would be money that we teach. Now, again, these are not the proper values, right? Or some of them could be proper. Well, just track along with me, right? We will teach that money, rely upon money. It's the best source of security, and the more money you have, the more important you may be. And so what we can inadvertently or advertently teach our children is that money is the thing that brings us either happiness or security or comfort or whatever, and that is a value in which we teach our children, okay? Conflict. Avoid it at all cons, uh, costs, right? Avoid it at all costs. Um, you know, if, 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 you know if, if you've got to get loud and you've got to get angry and it, this is going to become a win-lose situation, you know, avoid it at all costs. Don't work it out. Don't sit down and have a conversation. Don't try to entertain someone else's perspective. Don't try to, you know, converse through it and find a win-win situation. Don't do that. Just avoid it at all costs. Now, some people would look at conflict and say, charge in. You, this is a win-lose situation and you need to win. So depending on how you look at it, conflict can become one of those values in which we teach our children how to deal with it. And this is how you deal with it, right? Sex. Don't ever discuss it openly. Don't ever discuss it openly. And also, men can be promiscuous, but women cannot. All right? That, and that can become one of those uncommunicated, but communicated, non-verbally communicated uh, values in which we are teaching our children. Grief and loss. Grief and loss. Sadness is a weakness. Don't show sadness. Don't open up. Don't share what you're feeling because that is a sign of weakness. And heaven forbid, don't ever be discouraged or depressed. Just bury it. Don't talk about it. Just continue on. Hold your head up high and just continue on. Expressing ang anger. It can be dangerous and bad. Explode to make a point and also guilt can motivate. And again, these are the things that we would say, man, I would never identify that as a value, but yet we can, it, it can so easily be, if we're not careful, these things can very easily be expressed that these are, of, these are in fact, values. Family, you owe it to your parents. You owe it to your parents. Don't ever air the dirty laundry. Don't ever talk about what happens within the house. Don't ever sell us out. Don't ever embarrass us, okay? Relationships. Don't ever trust people. They're going to hurt you. Build up walls. Only let people come in so close, but definitely do not trust people, especially authority figures. Hold them at an arm's length. Never trust someone that's a leader or in an authority position. Attitudes towards other cultures. Only get close to the people that you're like, right? 
Only get close to the people that are like-minded. Only get cl- don't don't entertain what they have to say. Don't hear something from maybe their perspective, but only from your perspective, your culture the, in which you have been exposed to. Success. You got to go to the best schools. You got to get the best education. You got to have lots of money. You got to have a family with kids. You got to have a nice house, nice car. You got to have the nice possessions. You got to have, you know, and, and it goes on and on, right? Success can become this value in which we build our lives upon. Feeling and emotions, which I already talked about, feelings are taboo. Do not talk about them and don't act upon them, right? Now, again, we could go on and on and on with this list, right? And, and again, we could say, well, these aren't really my values, but yet, This is somehow what we could easily, inadvertently, be teaching our children that these things truly are values because this is what we focus on, right? These are the things we focus on. And these can become our false idols. These can become our false gods, which means that I can pursue some of these things. And I, for instance, like money, I believe it's going to give me something that only God can provide, security, or whatever it may be, right? and they can become an idol. An idol is something that we look at and we elevate it to the position that it's going to give us something that only God can give us. And God is saying, no, I want, I want to be at the center of your heart. I don't want any of these other things to be at the center of your heart. I want all these other things to flow, be impacted by me that's at the center of your heart because I am your number one value. You're going to love me with everything you've got, your strength, your soul, everything that you have. God would go on to say in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, do not have any other gods beside me. And I think that's what we're talking about. You know, what is it that we truly value? So the question would become this. If God wants to be at the center of my life, if God wants to be, at the, because if we look at a, if we would look at a circle and God is at the center of my life, then everything else is impacted by what? By my Christian worldview. Everything flows through God because He is the center of my heart. So everything is impacted, my work, my my children, my job, my, my success, my money, my time. Everything is impacted and affected by God because He, as a, he as a, is at the center of my heart. But the question becomes this, how do we keep God at the center of our hearts? How do I put God in the center? And I think there's five areas we can look at today, and that's what I want to share with you. Number one, money is one. Money is one because in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says this, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wines. And and, and it's this tithing concept. It's this 10% at the very beginning. It's saying, God, I'm going to give you 10%. That's what the word tithe means. I'm going to give you a tenth, a a, a tenth, a, 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 a very onset of my income. Every paycheck, I'm going to give you 10% of that right at the beginning because you are first. You are at the center of my heart, my life. And that's why tithing is so important because tithing says that if I'm not tithing, then God is not really first in my life. I'm not really trusting Him with my money. I'm not really trusting Him. And and let's be honest, money is one of those things that, again, can just take over our lives. We can, again, place all this sense of security in it. We can elevate it to all this other status, and it literally takes the place of God. God is the one that says, I will take care of you. God is at the center of my life. If He's not first in our finances, He's really not first in our lives. The second one would be this, interests. Okay? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for God's glory. What do you talk about the most? Because that's when you really get to know someone and what's at the center of their heart, their passions and their desires, their interests. Because we're going to talk about, that's the stuff that we talk about. Those are the things that we spend a lot of time talking about. Those are the things that when you meet someone, you can pretty much know what what is at the center of their heart not too long because they can talk on and on and on and become very passionate about their interests and their desires. Is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it, you know, do we, you know, 
we could talk hours about our passions and interests, but have a really hard time talking about Jesus for three minutes in a conversation. If He's first in our lives and we're going to make God, then God will become part of our conversation. He will come up in any and every conversation because we won't be ashamed to talk about Him because He is at the center of our hearts and we're building our lives upon Him. He is that value. He is what we are building our lives upon and He is first within our lives. So we have money, that we, we have money, we have interests and influences. If you want God first in your life, you're going to have to choose who you hang out with very carefully because a lot of times, more than not, whoever we hang out with the most, we're going to become like them. There is this sense of influence that, that tends to uh, influence us, right? Put a stamp on us. So we need to be very careful. Are those people, those relationships that we have, are those people helping us grow closer to Jesus or are they taking us further away from Jesus? Are they enabling us to, to again, keep God at the center of our hearts or are they taking that away and it's, it's, it's affecting our, you know, the, these people are affecting, or affecting or influencing us in a negative way. Proverbs 27, 19 says this, What a man is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. Very interesting. We become like, again, these people that we spend the most time with. You spend time with people who take God lightly, you're going to begin to take God lightly as well. You spend a lot of time with people who take God very serious and they're building their lives upon God. They encourage you and they help you along the journey and you are going to, you are going to be influenced in keeping God at the center of your life. The question becomes for you, who are those people within your life? Who are the closest relationships you have and are they helping you grow closer to Jesus? Or are they taking you more away from Jesus? Time. Time. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Jesus often slipped away to spend time with the Father, to understand, to spend time with His Father in prayer and solitude to spend time with Him uh, uh, praying and conversing with Him and also understanding what was the will of the Father. Jesus was all about accomplishing the will of the Father. Not His own, but the will of the Father. He, I mean, He, again, often in the early morning, uh, in the darkness, He would slip away and go to some place and spend time with God. Jeremiah says this, my people have forgot, but God says this through the prophet Jeremiah, my people have forgotten me for days on end. You've forgotten me. You have forgotten me. Schedule a daily appointment with God. That is one way that you can keep God at the center of your heart. You can keep Him at the center of your heart through tithing because it reminds us again that God is at the center of my heart. God is the one who provides. God is the one who sustains. Our, my interests you know, is, is, is it centered around God? Uh, influences, who am I going to allow to commit to be in my life into those very close circles? Are they influencing me in a positive way? Or are they influencing me in a way that's taking me away from Jesus? Time, as I said, do I use time to help keep God at the center of my life? Or do I use my time for myself? Do, am I selfish? Do I use time for myself? Um, uh, do I barely give God any time? Because if that's the case, He is not at the center of my life and my heart, and I'm not going to be building my life upon the values of God if I am not spending time with God. Support. The last one is support. Who do you call in the time of trouble? And what's really sad, and we talked about this a little bit with Jonah, is like a lot of times, the, only, the, the times we really go to God quickly is when we're in trouble. But part of that is true, right? Part of it is true, but hopefully we are looking at this relationship a lot differently. That it's not just the times in trouble that I go to God for support and I go to God for help, but, but I have this, I have this intimate relationship with, with, I have this intimate relationship with God. He is at the center of my heart and I go to Him. I spend time with Him in prayer, but I also, I also go to Him in times of trouble. I go to Him in times of discernment. I go to Him in times where I'm trying to figure things out because I'm not going to lean on my own understanding as Solomon writes as well. 
Psalm 50, 15 says this, Call on me in a day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. So my question is, when you face unexpected pressures, when you face unexpected problems, when you have a crisis, who do you turn to? Do you turn to God? Now, again, I, I, you know, I said that you know, that's the only, sometimes that's the only time we turn to God, but hopefully that is who we do go to because we are acknowledging that through prayer by going to God, we're acknowledging that God, I don't have it. God, I don't have the ability. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the discernment. I don't have the, 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 the intellect. I don't have the strength. I don't have what it takes to figure this out, but you do. And so we go to God. That's what prayer really is. Prayer is coming into the presence of God and admitting that I don't have the abilities to fix this problem, to control this issue, to figure this out, to take care of this. And so we go to God. We go to God for support. We go to God for wisdom. We go to God uh, for um, you know, those, those moments where we just don't know what to do and we feel so helpless. And we go to Him in a humble and contrite spirit, asking Him for, for help. My question to you is this, who is the first person that you might go to when you need help? Is it another person? And again, other people certainly can play a role in that. Again, going back to our, who influences us, right? And there are men and women within my life, there are men and women within your life that they're your go-tos, right? I get that. I understand that. They're positive influences. They do have uh, an understanding of who God is, and they, they, um, they have, a, they have a, a intimate, close walk with God. However, the first person should be God Himself, where we get on our knees and we go to God. And we spend time with God and we ask Him and we go to Him in prayer. And we ask Him to help us navigate through this particular situation that we are experiencing. Here's the other thing. And again, I get that we're all human here. I understand that. And I understand we all uh, deal with this to a certain degree. But if we have worry within our lives, that is an indication that God is not, is, that we're not going to God first and foremost. Now, there's a difference between thinking about something and worrying. Worrying is when we just stew and stew and stew, and it's got us. And I want to tell you something. I confess, I confess, I've been there. And I've been there pretty recently, too. I confess that. And I want to tell you something. The more I worry, the more I realize I'm not giving this to God. I'm not going to God in prayer. I'm not spending time, enough time with God to say, God, I don't have this and I'm, and I'm concerned. I don't have this because worrying, all it's doing is indicating to me that Gail is trying to figure it out. That's what worry is. It's not just thinking about it and contemplating. It, and let's not rationalize it and justify it. Worrying is when Gail is trying to take control and Gail is trying to fix it. It's a clear indication that I am not spending time with God and allowing God to have this particular situation that I can't figure out. So if we have worrying with worry within our lives, it is a clear indicator that God is not first in, in our lives. And I know that's hard to hear, but let's just be honest. That is, that is the truth. And so today, as we again continue to, to, um, to, to kind of, um, uh, intro this heroes, a hero is someone that's going to keep God at the center of their lives, that they're going to build their life upon the values in which, uh, of God. They're going to keep God so tight at the center of their heart that their lives are going to be built on the principles of which God has identified, not what we identify as a successful life, but it's how God looks at it. And here are five areas. We just talked about five areas that can help us keep God at the center of our hearts. Please go back and just kind of review that Deuteronomy chapter 6 um, passage. Uh, and, and some of these other passages that I shared with you. But I would like for you, if you would, to just be very open and honest right now as I uh, conclude our time together, that you would maybe think about what are the true actual values of your life? And are they being demonstrated? That what you identify, are they being demonstrated within your life? And then maybe ask yourself the question, what are the values 
that are being that I'm demonstrating in my life, either advertently or inadvertently, right? And maybe we can see where God has been edged out a little bit. And maybe this is where we can go to God in prayer and ask for forgiveness and help to say, God, please help me keep you at the center of my heart. I pray that you will just stick with us through this series called Heroes. I think you will find it very encouraging, and I think you will find it very uplifting at times, and I think you'll find it very challenging. Uh, So I just ask and implore you that you would just stay with us from week to week and let us just bring God His glory by exalting Him and spending time in His Word and focusing on keeping Him at the center of our hearts. So right now I would ask that you would just grab your elements, whatever they may be. Uh, It doesn't matter, we're not legalistic here. Whatever you're using to remind, this is just symbolism. Whatever you have that's going to remind you um, of the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross and His flesh that He sacrificed for you so that we we might have salvation. If you would get those together, we're going to take communion uh, together because this is what we're saying is at the center of our hearts. This is what we're saying is what we are going to build our lives upon and not just our lives, but even if we have young children, that we're going to be teaching our children what the true values are and that is keeping God at the center of our hearts. Communion reminds us of that because communion reminds us that He has provided us salvation, that He loved us so much that He chose to leave and set aside uh, many of His attributes and to step down into this broken world and take on your sin and my sin and give us His righteousness who Jesus lived sin free. What an incredible message. And it reminds us that as Christians, if we have received His free gift of grace and salvation, it reminds us that He is at the center of our hearts, that He should be at the center of our hearts. And so today, I ask that you would take whatever you have that reminds you of the flesh, and let's take and let's remind remind ourselves the work that He did on the cross as He hung there, His physical body hung there, and um, took on your sins and my sins so that we could have a relationship with Him. Let's take and let's eat. And then let's take whatever we have that reminds us of His blood and be reminded of the blood that He shed, the blood on the cross that He shed for you and I. Let's take and let's drink. As I shared with you a little bit earlier, it was great to be with you this week. I trust that you this week and pray that you might reflect upon what you truly value. And I pray and trust that you will be very open and honest. And if God is not at the center of your heart, I trust that right now you might take a minute and just pray and that you might just ask for forgiveness. And again, allow God to be at the center of your heart. Surround me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart
power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I Praise the